yes, my name is Jay Metz. That's not a typo. That is actually my name. Uh, I am an R&D engineer for, uh, for Cisco Systems for Advanced Storage. I am also on the board of directors for SNEA as well as NVMe. And so I come to you in the capacity of wearing multiple hats and to try to help give you a little bit of an understanding as to what's happening inside of the NVMe spec moving forwards. So what we're going to talk about today is we're going to be working on some of the, the things that are going on now for development into the standard in the future. So some of the things that we'll be talking about are just about ready to be standardized, and some of the things that we'll be talking about are uh, still a little ways away. Okay. So when I give you this information, just keep in mind that this is not done completely. Right? These are all things that we're working on. There are over 50 different projects inside of the NVMe working groups right now, and they cover a broad scope of topics, including management, including fabrics, including the base specification, and even some offshoots, uh, things like key value, but that's going to be a topic for another day. So keep in mind that everything that we're going to be talking about today is under construction and can, and in some cases, likely will change. I will let you know about the things that are pretty much standardized or just about to be standardized. <coughs> For those of you who are involved in the standards development, like Mark here, um, uh, keep me honest, make sure that I'm up to date on my timing because things can change on a moment by moment notice. And I also know that Mark has no problem correcting me when I'm wrong. So a lot of people don't realize that NVMe has actually been around for a while. Um, so I, 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 I know I need to have a clue as to who I'm talking to, so I don't make sure that I don't want to. Uh, you know, uh, talk up or down. I want to make sure that I got the right level here. How many people actually do development with NVMe? Okay, good, 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 good. All right, so, so I, all I want to do is just do a quick level set to make sure that everybody's on the same page right now. Right now, the, the common standard for NVMe is 1.3. The common standard for management is 1.0a. And the common standard for fabrics is 1.0. All good? All right. Now, obviously, we have a lot of these works being done in parallel, but they're all tightly integrated as well, as you probably well know. So that's where we are right now with a lot of the things that are going on, with some of the feature sets that have been going on inside the NVMe base spec, as well as things that have been evolved into the management and the fabric. So let's start off with a broad overview of what we're going to be talking about today. As I said, there are 50 projects going on right now for development inside of NVMe. I had to narrow it down into three major sections and keep it limited inside of those three major sections for the time that we have today. In the base spec, there's three key points that we're going to be discussing. One is IO determinism, and I'm only going to talk a little bit about IO determinism because Mark is going to be going into further detail in the next session, so I'm not going to try to steal any of his thunder other than explain the rough, est rough estimates of what it is. We'll talk a little bit about the developments in persistent controller memory buffers, as well as event logging, and the updates to multipathing, which also have implications for the NVMe over fabrics. In fact, it's the need for multipathing capabilities in fabrics that allows us to, or forced us to think about doing it in the base spec. We're also going to be talking about some of the advances in, in the management interface, the NVMe MI 1.1, which uh, for the most part, these are done effectively, right? The, the final votes on some of these are not completely done, but effectively it's just basically copy editing and, you know, the minor details. And then finally, we'll be talking a little bit about NVMe over fabrics and some of the things that are pretty hot to trot inside of NVMe over fabrics. All right, so let's talk about a little bit about these improvements and where they're supposed to be going. So first and foremost, NVMe 1.4 is the name of the next specification that we're going to be doing, and it's probably going to be around sometime in 2019 that it'll be finalized and completed. One of the things that we're going to be doing inside of NVMe 1.4 is something called IO determinism. And as I said, Mark's going to go into further detail. But realistically, when we have um, these devices so close together, and we have the workloads being uh, uh, communicated to the devices so close together, you run into some possibilities of QoS problems, noisy neighbors, and the like. So what IO determinism is going to be doing is allowing you to identify different, uh, different types of workloads to specific media types and allow you to try to coordinate 
those different um, parallel write IOs without having to worry about interference of each other or the background processes that exist inside of those devices. So the idea here is that we want to improve the quality of service and improve the latency situation because of, of unintended consequences of really dense pathing. So what does it look like? Effectively, right now on the left-hand side of the screen, you can see we have an example of, of what happens with no I.O. determinism. All of the workloads go into a single drive. In this particular case, we're making it nice and simple. It's a four terabyte drive. And all of the data is placed according to their uh, respective namespaces. But when you have a background process that goes along that particular device, whether it be trim or it happens to be garbage collection, it could affect the write or the read latency with regards to any one of those workloads, if not all of them. With IO determinism, on the other hand, what we do is we effectively break these down into sets, and we identify those sets instead of one monolithic four terabyte system. We now have four logical one terabyte systems, each dedicated to a particular workload. So that when we have the, the background processes that go on in any one of these different sets, they're not necessarily affecting all the other ones. And of course, as I said, Mark is going to go into much greater detail with regarding that. So was that fair? Great, okay. One of the other things that we're doing has to do with something called the, uh, the, the persistent memory region. Now with 1.2, with NVMe 1.2, one of the things that we were able to do was borrow some of the SRAM or DRAM uh, memory space for handling rapidly accessible commands to the device. And that was really good because when you actually have to control, uh, talk to the controller inside of a device itself, expediting and making faster the ability to execute those commands is a good thing. So what we were able to do was carve out something called the controller memory buffer inside of the SRAM DRAM space, and we were able to uh, facilitate faster processing of those commands. But SRAM and DRAM is volatile. So if there was a power interrupt or any kind of power problem, we had the issue of losing potential uh, data. And then you have all kinds of issues that you have to take care of to uh, resurrect what you're, where you were and what you were doing and get kind of synchronicity. So what 1.3 does, sorry, what 1.4 does is it introduces the idea of a persistent memory region, which means that when you need to do this, you can borrow some of the persistent memory that exists inside of the NVMe device to add persistency to those memory shared spaces. So now we have the ability to have non-volatile persistent memory spaces in conjunction with the volatile control memory buffer. And that provides you with extra resiliency in the course of the read-write of the commands to the device. So far, so good? Okay, <clears throat> now, multipathing. Interestingly enough, multipathing is not called multipathing in the spec. <laughs> Instead, what multipathing is called is called symmetric or asymmetric namespace access. This is one of the joys of having specification and standard ease language. So we've had um, multipathing inside of the NVMe spec pretty much since day one. We've been able to have shared host access into NVMe devices. And basically, with a PCI, PCIe system, you have consistency across all of the different hosts to the final, final NVMe target. It's over a PCIe bus, it's using shared memory space, and the host really doesn't care all that much when it comes to um, you know, the, the pathing, right? The trouble comes when we start to get into asymmetric paths that you have to be um, aware of. So what we do, this is, this is something that's well understood in any kind of storage network over, remotely. Right? Whether we're talking about fiber channel or they're talking about InfiniBand, or um, any of the SCSI-based systems over Ethernet, you are aware of the, the issues that involve uh, asyn uh, sorry, asymmetrical pathing across the network. So what we're doing inside of the, um, inside of the, the NVMe 1.4 spec is the ability to have the host aware of these types of asymmetrical pathing environments. Because when you have this kind of inconsistent latency between one host and uh, a namespace and another host namespace to the same target, it becomes much more important for coordination purposes. So we do care quite a bit. As, as these systems begin to get more complicated, as they start to get more complex, as they start to get more involved, 
we have the ability to have communication back to the host that allows us to be able to control this in a much uh, greater fashion. So let's just take a quick look example of this. In this particular example, we've got um, solid red lines, solid blue lines for different paths to the different namespaces that are um, effectively optimized. But when you have non-optimized solutions or non-optimized pathing to uh, the other you know, crisscross namespaces, right now there's no way of notifying that back to the host. Now we have the ability to notify that back to the host. And so that, this is a lot of what we're talking about inside of these uh, specifications is increased awareness of what's going on from the target to the host. There's a lot of that improved communication so that the host can actually do some, some interesting things that, uh, as opposed to just have it be data on a stick. Okay, so that um, is not the only thing that's going on, but that's what we're going to be talking about so far. We've also got some improvements in the event logging. We have some additional improvements in terms of... Um, uh, the, the, the relationship back and forth between where the, where, the, where the error logs are kept and how they're communicated and a couple of other additional things. For time's sakes, I've, I've pulled it out of this particular uh, spec, speaking of which. Okay, there are a couple of different work items we've got inside of the management interface. Now, right now, we're at the 1.0a interface, and that provides us with some pretty good uh, out-of-band management techniques, <clears throat> but there are instances and implications for management that go just beyond a, a simple out-of-band management uh, architecture. So one of the things that we've been doing is we've been including the fact that you need to be able to manage the actual enclosures themselves, right? So one of the things that we've done is improved some of the, the, the standardized SES enclosure management systems. We could have created our own uh, version, but we've decided to adopt and inherit a lot of the SCSI-based systems because even though NVMe and SCSI are different protocols, we still have the same kind of component structures. You still got the fans, you still got the drive bays, you still got the, uh, the PCBs, you still have the power, and you need to be able to control and manage all of these different things. Um, so what we've also done is we've, we've, so we have the enclosure management. The other thing that we've managed, uh, we've really been working on is support for in-band management. We currently have out-of-band, and now we are also supporting in-band. And then we've got some NVMe storage devices. So let's take a quick look at what these actually mean. So, as I said, we've got these different kinds of enclosure managements, and we have two different types that we've been including inside of the NVMe MI spec. The first kind is the most simple of all. It's the PCIe enclosure management, or P, um, <laughs> I can always get it, NPEM is how it's called. And it's very simplistic. It basically allows you to add in uh, the, the, the uh, ability for indication of different drives inside of an enclosure system. It's very simple, it doesn't do um, a lot, it doesn't overlap with this, the, uh, the other base system at all. It's, if, you want the, if you want the full tool suite, however, that's where we use the, the SES-based enclosure management system. And again, that's based uh, on the, uh, the T10 stuff that came out um, a long time ago. And so, all of the, both of these were developed inside of the NVMe MI working group. The, the uh, NPEM was proposed and accepted inside of the PCIe SIG. And then the SES enclosure management uh, is, is based inside of uh, NVMe MI. So um, looking just a little bit further into this, um, I think I've actually covered a lot of this in, in verbally. Realistically, what we've done is we've adopted some of the different uh, SES command structures that we use for SCSI and then modified it for NVMe. The key thing here to keep in mind are these, the fact that these SCSI send diagnostics and the SCSI receive diagnostics are now an NVMe command structure that are wrapped inside of the NVMe as uh, SES send and SES receive. But otherwise, they're almost identical kinds of enclosure management structures. Okay, so in-band, out-of-band, and rock band. All right, so in out-of-band management, typically what winds up happening is you have a separate BMC controller that um, handles all of the different uh, management structure. It's completely isolated from the host operating system. This allows you to do things in case the host can't actually access the, the devices themselves, but you still want to be able to manage it. Um, however, there are additional form factor types for NVMe devices that do lend themselves better to in-band management. 
Right? For example, if you want to be able to manage the device uh, using the NVMe command structure and the NVMe admin queues themselves, we can wrap in in-band management uh, commands inside of an NVMe queue pair to be able to manage those kinds of devices. And certain types of form factors lend themselves better to um, having the in-band system. For example, if you're using, let me just, this is off the top of my head at the moment, but if you're using an open channel SSD, for instance, that happens to be part of a system, but not necessarily a dedicated enclosure with its own NVMe structure, you could use an NVMe in-band management structure to handle that kind of system. Okay? So you now have a choice, or you will have a choice when NVMe 1.4 comes out to allow you to choose either in-band or out-of-band management according to your uh, deployment uh, schedule and deployment types. The other thing that we have is we're increasing the ability to manage different types of form factors. So right now, you can have a device that allows you to have multiple namespaces. You can have multiple uh, NVMe controllers. You can have multiple uh, media, um, uh, you know, media uh, devices or media types, but they all have to be part of the same NVMe sub or NVM subsystem. There are, however, products on the market, and these are just two examples, that have multiple NVM subsystems. So what NVMe MI is allowing you to do is manage devices with multiple NVM subsystems. So we're expanding the ability to do uh, management of multiple different types of devices. Okay, and then finally, Couple of different topics we're, we're going to be doing with uh, NVMe over fabrics. Probably the most notable is the NVMe TCP specification, which is just about ready for completion. It's in the last phase, phase three. So right now we can do NVMe over fabrics that includes fiber channel, InfiniBand, RD, well, other RDMA-based systems, and we're also including the ability to do TCP. Why is this important? Well. TCP allows us to have a, an additional ability to, to use NVMe blocks uh, devices over a common uh, network, over a common Ethernet network. Right? And it also allows us to do something really interesting, which is to be able to separate out the control plane just like we typically do inside of an Ethernet network. We could use a one gigabit control plane, for instance, using NVMe MI commands or NVMe uh, uh, you know, over fabrics commands using TCP without having to have it embedded on a, on a high-speed link, which is common in, say, for, for example, there are some uh, you know, iSCSI deployments, for instance, that use uh, low bandwidth kinds of uh, control plane stuff. I thought I saw a hand. No? Okay. Um, and this is almost done, actually. We're in the last phase. It says the first half of 2018. I would anticipate that probably within the next two to three months this is going to be good to go if if that long, to be honest. It's, it's very, very close. And finally, we have a problem with discovery when it comes to the Ethernet side. Um, we have other types of discovery in the fabrics for, say, fiber channel. It's got an, inherently, uh, uh, an inherent discovery mechanism inside of fiber channel. Ethernet does not have an inherent discovery system. And right now, if you want to use an Ethernet-based NVMe system, you have to effectively do the, the equivalency of an Etsy host file. You have to manually go in and identify what the address is, or you have to cobble together your own discovery protocol. But there is no standardized way of doing this. What the Enhanced Discovery Initiative is trying to do is be able to create a standardized approach to doing a system-wide controller to allow the registration and reservation of NVMe devices for just auto discovery. And I know I'm racing through this, and believe me or not, believe it or not, I actually thought this was gonna be a 75 minute presentation, so I took out a lot of stuff. <laughs> All right, so last but not least, um, uh, we've got a lot of different stuff going on inside of the NVMe uh, groups. I've only really scratched the surface, I'm very, very brief, and I'm so sorry about that. But we have key improvements to both the NVMe base spec, the, the management interface, as well as the fabrics, and they all tie in together. We can use all of these different things according to the, we can layer them as, as necessary. So I want to thank you very much. Um, I apologize for talking really fast. I tried to, to slow it down a little bit, but I guess it didn't quite work. Thank you.